Well, ladies and gentlemen, for me, this has been one of the most interesting sessions that I've been to because, first of all, we had the theological perspective from Karl Weisner, which is always profoundly informative and eloquently expressed. Liz, of course, gave us some of the rather hideous political movements that lie behind the global warming religion. And the fusion of the global warming science and the true religion, which is being attempted across the road, was well exposed by Mark Morano. And then the three very distinguished and eminent scientists who preceded me have done each their own individual research on climate sensitivity, not because anybody paid them to, not because they take any political stance one way or the other, not because the Koch brothers funded them, <laughs> nor were they funded by a, uh, as one person in this room was, by a internet gaming fraudster who was ordered by a judge in the United States on being convicted of fraud to repay $185 million of his ill-gotten gains. We are not funded by these people. We do our scientific research because we are interested to try to find the right answer wherever the science leads us, without being paid to do it, without having any prejudicial point of view to start with, but with that open mind, which Abu Ali ibn al-Haytham, founder of the scientific method in the East, as Thales of Miletus had been in the West, said that a scientist is a seeker after truth. And the seeker after truth, he said, does not place his faith in any mere consensus however venerable, however widespread. Instead, he subjects what he has learnt of that consensus to his hard-won scientific knowledge, to scrutiny, investigation, inspection, inquiry, checking, checking, and checking again. The road to the truth, said al Haitha, is long and hard, but that, he said, is the road we must follow. And that was the manifesto of the Lord of Life. I was born, I came into the world to bear witness to the truth. And our fear here today is that the Holy See, in abandoning its previous practice of allowing both sides of this legitimate scientific debate to be heard, may be in danger of repeating in future the mistakes it has regrettably made in the past by adopting, as though they were theological positions, scientific positions which turned out not only to be theologically but also scientifically untenable. So our aim in having come to Rome at the behest of the Heartland Institute, to whom we are very grateful for having laid on our own alternative conference on global warming and religion. Our aim is to say with profound respect to the United Nations and to the Holy See, to Ban Ki-moon and also to His Holiness Pope Francis, please bear in mind that there are two sides to this scientific question and that on the evidence and on the data a word which I am delighted to say has come up so often during our presentations here. It is our side of the case, with all respect, that may yet prove to have been correct. And that if you take decisions, decisions which could have profoundly damaging impacts on the poor people of the world, then you will not be remembered by history with kindness. And you may end up damaging the institutions, both of which were founded with a noble purpose, whose current stewards you are. We pray, therefore, that wiser councils than we witnessed this morning in the Casa Pio 
Quattro, will prevail. That you will, in future, make sure, as you always did in the past, that both sides of this uh, question are heard. And that in the encyclical, which is to be published in the next month or two, you will reserve judgment on the scientific question, allow us, the scientists and researchers, to slug it out among ourselves, encourage us to seek for the truth, and encourage everyone to have that respect for and devotion to the natural world within which we find ourselves that is enjoined upon us in the 22nd chapter of the book of Genesis. To answer one question, no, there is no conflict between true religion and true science. Our aim is to make sure that we do not get a conflict between true religion and bad science that has fooled true religion into accepting it. We are, we are here today because the science is not good. And because there is an attempt here to establish what is unquestionably, if it is put in place, going to become the world's first global tyranny. That may sound absurdly extreme, in which event I invite you to turn to the United Nations draft of the Paris Treaty. You'll have to hack through 80 or 90 pages of UN verbiage. If you're not familiar with what the verbiage means, get in touch with me. I've sat through enough of these conferences I can translate it to. But what it says is that a global governing body, they are no longer calling it a government, but that is what they mean, is to be established, and that all the powers of nations to decide on matters of the environment and climate change are to be delegated and deferred to that body which will complete the process that these negotiations over the last 23 years have begun. It will be lavishly funded. It will have absolute power. It will not be elected. It will be entitled both to levy direct taxation on the world and all the member states of the United Nations. It will also be able to impose direct environmental regulation upon them. And all of this in the name of a theory which, as the scientists among us have already well established, is in essence false. Now what I want to do is to look at where the nations of the earth stand as we approach Paris. It's an alarming picture. Sir David King, the climate change ambassador to the United Kingdom government, who has been going around bleating at other governments around the world that might have shown signs of being recalcitrant, gave a report to the Environment Committee of the House of Commons, this time last year, and even as early as that, he said there were only two nations, Canada and Australia, who were standing out against accepting what is in effect going to be global government in Paris this December. The clock is very much ticking now. Now, in the United Kingdom, we, we have some of the most insane climate policies in the world. It is arguable that those policies contributed to the deaths of some 7,000 people over and above the normal excess deaths in a cold winter three years ago because people couldn't afford to heat their homes during a month-long period of intense sub-zero cold. Unfortunately, Russia has uh, a dog in this fight in the shape of the Siberian gas. And Russia wants to keep the price of gas high and is therefore very active among the funding, the green groups in Europe, particularly the anti-fracking groups, so that it can continue to sell Siberian gas into the over-regulated and overpriced European market from which Russia is benefiting. Because in Europe, thanks to these regulations, the price of natural gas is between two and three times the world price. Russia is the main beneficiary of that absurdity and is willing to, it changed its policy in 2004 as a result of a visit from Tony Blair who said he would get Russia most favoured nation states of status at the UN if only it would agree to change its stance and tell its Academy of Sciences to shut up 
because the Academy had decided that climate change was essentially nonsense. And at that moment, the policy was changed because Putin had been told by his economic advisors that if Europe could keep gas prices high, then Russia would make a fortune, and it is making a fortune at our expense here in Europe. These flags, incidentally, are the flags of the Communist Party of Denmark. The first time that I can trace that Communist flags were flown after the Berlin Wall came down in 1990, and this was at the UN Copenhagen Climate Summit, which mercifully failed as a result of China refusing blandishments from Mr. Obama and saying it did not want any interference from outside in its internal affairs, and it wanted to lift its people out of poverty by the cheapest method available, which is affordable fossil fuels. Now, the Sunni Arab world, which is having a more or less death struggle that's going on behind closed doors with the, the Shia faction in Iran. It has forced, quite deliberately forced, oil and gas prices down to levels we haven't seen for many a decade. And this is to hurt Iran, which is also an oil producer, and to punish Russia, and also to try to make US fracking and European fracking unprofitable. Now the US, with that commendable adaptability and yes, we can uh, attitude, which even its president has occasionally been heard to express, has managed to continue to frack profitably at prices well below what the economists thought they could. So that hasn't worked. And I hear from the Arab world that they're likely to push oil prices up, perhaps even to as high as $200 by later this year. I told the advisor to the uh, King of Saudi Arabia, who told me that, but I did not believe that they would now be able to do that, so we'll see who's right. Now, Mr. Obama's climate policy has helped to bankrupt the United States by doubling its national debt in just the last five years, a trick which the UK has also worked under David Cameron. But Obama is irrelevant to global foreign policy. It's a remarkable thing to say, an American president, but if this is an president, I'm afraid it's true, except in one very crucial respect, and that is that he has personally exempted China from making any controls whatsoever in carbon dioxide emissions. Now, China announced in its 2000 five-year plan that it would allow a growth in uh, its carbon emissions because they were going to build one or two power stations, coal-fired power stations, every week somewhere in China between then and 2030. The effect of that, which began to kick in in about 2002, is dramatically evident in this graph because it crossed with the United States in 2005 to 6, and in only less than a decade, the China is now emitting twice as much CO2 as the United States. It now burns half of all coal burned in the world. It will soon be burning very nearly all the coal burned in the world. And its CO2 emissions, which are not going to be reduced until at least 2050, will, whatever they may say, that's the figure that the Chinese economists are really working on, uh, it is going to mean that whatever we do in the West, whatever the Pope now said, will make no difference at all. Carbon dioxide emissions are going to rise unchecked on a very gentle, exponentially increasing curve until at least the middle of this century. Now, of course, there is still the talk of what can the, the West do to cut its carbon emissions and make a difference. The answer is, we can't. It's now China, and eventually it's also the India and other countries now in the third world that will be emitting so much that whatever we do in the West, we are now irrelevant to the solution of this problem. We're not used to this, but it is the case, and it's time that we faced it. Now, China's policy is dominated by one consideration only, which I've never yet seen reported in the West. It is desperately short of natural resources, and has been for decades. That's why it invaded Tibet, to get the neodymium, to get the dysprosium, to get the copper, to get the lithium, to build the railway up to Lhasa, to ship it out. That's why they invaded Tibet. They have been very quietly going around doing bilateral deals with individual nations to secure the huge supplies of natural resources they need and wherever they can to lock out the West from getting access to those resources. So China has been getting on with building its own economy as we implode ours. 
Now the EU simply sees the process as of, of climate change as a way of consolidating its centralizing totalitarian unelected power. The UN simply wants this. And at Paris, at the moment, it's going to get it. The third world countries simply want money. They think they're going to get money out of this process, and they are not. Most of the money is going to go to the bureaucrats, as it always does with the UN. The UN is about money. Money not for the third world, but for itself. And as for the Holy See, whatever it says now is too little and too late. So all it is doing is making a Me Too statement. What are the Green Movement doing? They are still living on planet cloud cuckoo land. The environmentalist profiteers of doom want the party to go on forever. And the people of the world have seen through this because of the data that you've heard from the other scientists. They've seen through it. And therefore, they are no longer rating global warming at all. This was last year's survey. This year's survey puts global warming dead last, and rightly so. So is climate action necessary? Well, the answer, of course, is no. Hansen's predictions were wrong. The 33 IPCC models illustrated here, an official report from Remote Sensing Systems Limited, were wrong. The 73 models measuring that crucial hotspot, which I had the honor to name, in the tropical upper troposphere, were wrong. The Met Office, the oldest meteorological organization in the world, was wrong. The latest generation of climate model intercomparison project models were wrong. The IPCC itself admits in its latest report in this postage size, postage stamp size corner of a graph that they published in the IPCC's latest report shows the models, both for the previous report and for the present one, to be wrong. They were wrong about methane in all four of their reports. And they themselves have had to revise downwards by almost half their predictions of near-term global warming. Their predictions were based on that red zone and the yellow zone below it in 1990. Now it's the green zone and the yellow zone above it, which is their current forecast. If that had been their starting forecast, they would not have been able to persuade anyone that anything needed to be done about the climate. But why have they been willing, at my insistence as an expert reviewer, among others, to reduce their short-term forecast this long, this much, without being willing to make any change to their long-term predictions? That is absurd, scientifically speaking. Now, you may say, well, perhaps it's because all those carbon emissions we're cutting in the West aren't making a difference. Here are the facts. There is the IPCC's 1990 report. There is the amount of CO2 in red there that we emitted in 2012, according to the most recent audit globally that is available. So we are still above the UN's predicted business as usual scenario. But there is the warming, and you'll see that warming has occurred half the predicted rate since that first report in 1990. The ocean, you may say that the heat has gone hiding in the ocean. That's the latest excuse. So I got the data, because data is what our conference here is all about. And I calculated, because nobody else had done it, the trend on the first 11 full years of the data from the Argo bathythermograph buoys. And you will see that we have a warming in the oceans at a terrifying rate of 0.2 Celsius per century equivalent. 0.2 Celsius per century equivalent. 0.02 per decade. Is sea level rising? Well, no, basically it isn't. The most accurate way of measuring it are the gravitational anomaly satellites. And they show, if anything, that in between 2003 and 2008, at any rate, when this graph was compiled, uh, the sea level was actually falling. It hasn't risen much since, according to the gravitational anomalies. So what they did was to introduce a complete fiction called the case of isostatic adjustment. Bingo! They declared that what was no sea level rise was a big sea level rise. 
Likewise, they said there would be a water vapor feedback that would give you that system gain factor of two in Dr. Keed's model. But in fact, some of the data, including the data here from the Inter International Satellite Cloud Climatology Project, does not show any increase in water vapor. And in the crucial mean troposphere, the hotspot zone, it actually shows a decline in water vapor, which means negative feedback. And negative feedback means you get less warming than you'd get without any feedback. Here is a correlation uh, done over the last 100 years of one of the most reliable pyrometer records of how much warming actually reaches the Earth, getting through the clouds, etc. In the area of the sunlight, rather, in the area of um, the South China Sea around Japan, and the temperatures in the South China Sea, and you'll see that the solar changes precede and match rather elegantly these temperature changes. Now, I must uh, confess that when I saw this graph, I was quite excited and I checked and I found that this is not confirmed all around the world. But it does nevertheless raise some questions which my distinguished academic colleague, Dr. Willie Soon, has been addressing about the role of the sun in climate change. My own paper, published with three distinguished colleagues, including Dr. Soon, just uh, a few months ago, in the science bulletin of the Chinese Academy of Sciences shows the green zone there is the zone in which we might expect warming in response to a doubling of CO2 concentration, very similar to the zones calculated by my three scientific predecessors at this podium. Then there is extreme weather. It is rather startling, isn't it, that in the last 810,000 years, global average temperature has varied by only 3.5 Celsius, up or down, from the mean. That's all. It takes a lot to shift the Earth's temperature. Would anyone like to tell me how much CO2 there is in the atmosphere today to the nearest tenth of one percent? Exactly, to the nearest tenth of one percent. Thank you, Tom, there isn't any. Zero. Zero. That is how little CO2 there is. And of course CO2 is a greenhouse gas, of course it causes warming. But how much of the warming it has caused, that has happened over the last 50 years or so, is very difficult to say. What we see in the present graph, which you see already from Lundqvist et al. 2010, is, if anything, a slight decline in temperatures over the last 2,000 years. You see a peak in the medieval warm period, a previous peak in the Roman warm period. If we went back further, we'd see peaks also in the Minoan warm period, before that in the uh, Egyptian Old Kingdom warm period, before that a long warm period lasting with one short break in the middle, 4,000 years, the Holocene climate optimum, during which temperatures on Earth were 2 to 3 Celsius degrees higher than they are today. So temperatures are already off the Holocene peak. We are heading towards an ice age. I'm not saying it's going to happen tomorrow. I hope it doesn't. It would kill a lot more people than global warming uh, does if it did. How often are all-time high temperature records set? In the 1930s, a lot of them. Since then, not so much. Greenland ice between 1992 and 2003 grew in thickness, about 1,500 metres, not much change in the coasts. Hurricanes, stable. Tropical storms, stable. Tropical cyclones, stable. Typhoons, stable. In fact, almost at their least level in the last 40 years. Droughts, declining, according to Howe et al. 2014. Steady state of the rainfall pattern on the longest record in the world, which is the UK Met Office record. I calculated the trend on it, nobody else has bothered to do it. We now have, on average, an extra two inches of rain per year, compared with 250 years ago. That is a stable climate. This is the data. Global sea ice extent, if you had a heartbeat as regular as this, you would be regarded as a very healthy little planet. It's not going anywhere. Annual extreme weather de deaths. Mr. Sachs today repeated what he has said before, that skeptics are people who have blood on their hands. Well, let's have a look at the facts. The fact is that extreme weather deaths are running at the lowest since we've ever been able to keep meaningful global figures. So none of what you've been told is true. So is there evidence of dishonesty? Yes, there is. Here is an attempt by the IPCC in 2007, a very influential graph, to try to show that the rate of global warming is accelerating and we are to blame. 
This is the temperature record from the Hadley Center in Graham, with four separate, correctly calculated trend lines laid upon it. And you'll see that the one that starts most recently is the steepest. And from this, they drew the entirely incorrect conclusion that the rate of global warming is accelerating and we are to blame. Here's why that's a fiddle. There were two previous periods with exactly the same warming rate, which they very carefully hid by putting trend lines straight across them instead of along them. If you take a sine wave, it has by definition a zero trend. But if we use the IPCC's figure, fiddle, bingo, you can make it appear that that has a rising trend when it doesn't. In the 1995 IPCC report, on five separate occasions, the scientists said we cannot detect any human influence on global temperature. All five were scrubbed at the request of the IPCC bureaucracy by one willing scientist and replaced with a single statement to the contrary. And here is the origin of the hockey stick graph on the front page of the World Meteorological Organization's uh, report of 1999 where they said that the tree ring records were a faithful reflection of global temperature. In fact, they had spliced on, without saying so, the real world measured temperatures to the tree ring data, which stopped at, or in one case, the green one, well below the zero line there. It was a straightforward fiddle. I checked to find out who was right. The IPCC in 1990, up at the bottom there, showing a clear medieval warm period, a little ice age and a little pimple of today's temperatures. So I got the sea level results going back for a thousand years, reconstructed beyond the tide gauges. And what it shows is a match with the IPCC's original graph and not with the hockey stick graph. That's independent verification of which is true. And if anyone still thinks there is a consensus about all this, we heard that word quite a bit this morning at the Vatican, no, there isn't. The actual consensus that most of the warming since 1950 was caused by us is 0.3%, and that's an official peer-reviewed result. Here is another example of what was published and what was true. That was published, hurricanes increasing, that was true, they'd been much bigger before. Here's another example, US Historical Climate Network tampering with the results to turn a fall in temperatures to a rise. Another example, this time um, US again, from GIS, the same trick being played. Here's another example from New Zealand, another one from Australia. And then there were the Himalayas, where we were told there would be no ice in 20 years from now. None of these things is true. Instead, we are putting up hideous machines from which on 60% of the Scottish landmass you can now see a wretched windmill marring the landscape and killing our wildlife. Environmental destruction in the name of saving the environment. And that is why when I shook Ban Ki-moon by the hand at the Vatican today, I looked him in the eye and said, Secretary General, be careful. Climate change may not be all that you are being told it is. And that is our message also with respect to Pope Francis. Have a care that you do not lead the church into another scientific error like the one you led it into or your predecessors led it into before. Let us keep science for the scientists and theology for the theologians and let us each in our own way be seekers after truth. God bless you, Pope Francis. God bless you, Ban Ki-moon. God bless you, sir. And God bless all of you who have withstood two and a half hours of badgering from us this afternoon.